Hey there, folks. Happy Monday, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, my name is Lisa Nicolau, and I am the Cross-Sector Data Sharing Program Director for the Michigan Health Information Network. And um, uh, the, the Data of Advanced Care Planning Workshop, this is session number two. Um, our host, Joanne uh, Jarvie, is just running a few minutes late to, to this, but we are going to uh, take a couple of minutes. I, I'm not sure if there's a way to do a show of hands. Who joined us for the first session? If you can raise your hand or do a thumbs up or what have you to say whether or not you were there for the first one. I see a few. That's awesome. Great. And we're getting more folks kind of joining all the time. So that's even better. Looking forward to a really robust conversation today where we carry on in the thread that we that we went over the, the, the national, the current state, and we did a little level set during our first session. This next session is about more in detailed conversations, and you all are really going to be critical to that work. So feel free. The more we come off mute, the more we come on camera, the more we engage in the conversation, the more robust this conversation becomes and the better the information comes. Um, while we're waiting for Joanne to join, I'm wondering, uh, we have a little poll. We did a little poll last time. It's going to be the same poll. We're trying to measure how, how are we coming at doing the work that we need to do with the level set. We're kicking off a quick poll here. If you can take a few minutes to go ahead, answer those poll questions and submit it, that would be greatly appreciated. We'll give like three, four minutes to be able to do that. Um, Caitlin, if you can kind of, you can see kind of where we are with that poll to see how we're doing at getting folks um, answering and what our, what our response rates are. Yep, we can. I, I can see the poll. Can everybody else see the poll? Feel free to unmute and just say yes or no. I don't see it. Oh, you don't? No. Oh, okay. That's a problem. I did see it and answered it and submitted it. Okay. Right again. All right. So did I. It's okay. back now. It's up and again. It, yeah, it came up for the second time. Okay. So. If we already answered it, should we? I, yeah, if you, answered it? It, if you don't mind trying one more time, for some reason, it's not recognizing that anybody is participating. I'm just seeing zero people filling it out, unfortunately. So I'm not sure. That's interesting. Give us a thumbs up if you've answered it, and that way we can know uh, <laughs> if we're, we're having technical difficulties. Okay, we're getting some folks who have answered it. Hopefully we've we're seeing some results pop up there, Caitlin. I am not. This is very interesting that everybody can see it and take it, but that we can't see the results. Oh. I'm and so now, sorry, folks. Um, I'm gonna end this one more time. Apologies. Last time it worked just fine for all of us, didn't it? It did. It has to be, it's because it's a Monday. Welcome to Mondays, right? <laughs> um, very interesting, folks. I'm very sorry. Well, it actually looks like if I share results, do you yes, see zero percent? We know it's it's showing up as like there are some some results in there. So whether you're seeing it or not, it's coming through. So if you've already done it once, don't do it again. But if you haven't done it, go ahead and do it. There we go. All right, keep it keep it rolling. 
when you've done uh when you've done it just again we'll give it a few more minutes to let everybody take the poll again if you've done it once don't do it again we'll just we'll just base it on time at this point i think One more minute. I see it still a couple of folks kind of joining the uh, the audio session. Not seeing other folks join in. Maybe another 30 seconds and then we'll pull it down and then we'll get a get a move on. All right. I say we haul that down and let's see. Can we display the results? Okay, so. The current state of advanced care planning in Michigan, are we familiar and not so familiar? So we see 30, uh, 25% very familiar. Actually, if, can everybody see the results? I don't want to read this stuff. I don't want to read. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, yeah. great. So it gives yeah. us a sense as to where we are, right? Um, ooh, 50% very familiar with kind of what my hint does. That's great. All right, so this gives us a whole lot of stuff. Keep in mind that at the end of this session, we're gonna redeploy it. We're gonna see whether or not we're kind of making progress in this work. So thank you very much for your uh, for your engagement on that. Um, Brandon, I see a hand raised. Is that from previous or do you have a question? If you have a question, just jump off mute and, and ask away. No, that was from the uh, earlier question. Okay, no worries. All right, so I'm not sure that Joanne has been able to join us, so you folks may be stuck with me. <laughs> um, do we want to move on to the next um, the next slide? I'm afraid to know what's on this next slide deck. <laughs> oh, look, see, Joanne's meant to be here. Instead, instead you're stuck with me. Um, for those of you who hadn't, haven't met Joanne, when she does join, she is a force of nature, and uh, we are so grateful to have her as the Senior Director of Outreach and Marketing Communications. Uh, she brings a lot more energy to this than I ever possibly could, uh, so I'm really hoping she returns very soon. <laughs> uh, next slide. Again, because we're dealing in this space with advanced care planning, it's not necessarily kind of a, a direct um, alignment with the, the Michigan Health Information Network. For those of you who are not as familiar who, with who the Michigan Health Information Network is, we are the state designated entity to continuously improve healthcare quality, efficiency, and patient safety by promoting secure electronic exchange of health information. It is not just uh, the, the technical movement of data, but it is also the human infrastructure that is needed, the legal infrastructure that is needed, and uh, the, 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 the stakeholder outreach that makes that health information exchange um, uh, so successful. Next slide. Oh, I really hate when she does these things to me. <laughs> data for good. Um, it's it's this intersection between um, uh, how do we how do we move data? That neutral data stewardship um, really allows my hint to operate in a space that allows us to engage with not just healthcare information as healthcare moves outward in these concentric rings out towards the community, out towards um, all of the different um, places where healthcare is delivered and uh, and health services are delivered, um, it really kind of allows us to act in that central um, central area between doing, uh, protecting, and collaborating um, to make sure that the information that we do move um, is is beneficial to our uh, the end users, to the care teams, to the payers, to uh, all of the folks that really kind of allows the ecosystem to function. Next slide. 
The goals of health information exchange, certainly we, uh, the MyHint has been around for 10 plus years. Uh, the goals are always to reduce inefficiencies, to improve the, the access to healthcare, to lower our healthcare costs, to better coordinate and, uh, uh, and ensure that quality of care is delivered and to understand how that information or how uh, uh, care is measured and to personalize medication or medicine for uh, individual patients. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. Oh, nope. Go back one. Uh, so this is number two of one more. There. Nope. I know there's. I know there's a slide in there somewhere for our th for our third session. Uh, the next uh, this series is exactly what we said. It's a series of three different workshops. First workshop occurred last month. That was really a level set to understand the state of where things are within Michigan. We had um, a really kind of an understanding of what the national literature and what the what the outcome measurements are really starting to say as it relates to advanced care planning and the direction nationally that this information is starting to take. This third session is where we kind of bring it all together. The in-depth conversations that we're having really kind of gets to see things from a multitude of different spaces. What we are looking to do is make sure that we have heard all of the different perspectives and then to be able to put forth what are the predominant recommendations. What we are going to ask you to do during that session is to really weigh in what those recommendations really need to be across the different conversations that we've had. So coming back to that session on May 10th, Please, the, the more consistency we have between the people who have been able to attend, the better off those recommendations will really be. So please come and join us on May 10th from 3 to 5 p.m. We may not need the full two hours we may, but please take the time to register for that event when we send out the follow-up along with the slides. You will receive the link to be able to register for that event. Put it on your calendars and please make sure that you attend with us. The link is also in the chat right now. Thank you. All right, next slide. Oh, that's where you get to say who the rest of our team is. I'm going to actually give the, the floor over to the rest of our team uh, because none of this is done with just one person's expertise. This is really about a team effort, including our larger team, which is all of you. Um, you've had the 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 horror of being having to deal with me up until now on this this. Uh, uh, webinar, but I wanted to take a time to introduce the rest of our team. Lauren, do you want to jump on camera and say hi to everybody and introduce a little bit about who you are and what you do? Talking on mute. All right, try that again. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lauren Phelan. I am a project manager at MyHen, so I oversee a couple different projects, different areas, um, but one of them happens to be advanced care planning, and that's why we're all here. So nice to meet you all. I'll be taking some notes during our meeting today, so you won't hear much from me, but I will be hearing a lot from you and writing it down. <laughs> so I may be jumping in to ask for clarification uh, to make sure that I document your thoughts accurately. Uh, so might hear a little bit more from me. So thank you. Fabulous. Thanks, Lauren. Van? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Van Lee. I'm the product marketing manager here for my HIN and for advanced care planning, um, and, spe and specifically our ACP exchange use case, which is one of our many use cases here at my HIN. Uh, it enables the exchange and sharing of submitted advanced directives and other ACP related documents to support our, our overarching goal um, in, in sharing information. So kind of think about me as, uh, think of me as kind of the technical resource uh, behind all of this. So good to be here. And thanks, Van. And Monica. Hi, my name is Monica Ward. I'm the program manager for Making Choices Michigan here at MyHen. Uh, you probably received a few emails from me leading up to this uh, webinar. So um, happy to have a, a face to the name here. Um, yeah, so that's, that's me. Fabulous. Thank you. And then behind the, behind the scenes, we have Caitlin Lewis. Caitlin is like the magic with our Marcom team. So eternally grateful for her and for, uh, for Joanne uh, to be able to help us put these uh, lovely webinars on. Um, next slide.
This was a slide from last time, and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. The first session was really the level set, current state, national state, and the state of literature on advanced care planning and outcomes. These next two sessions are more facilitated conversations, really looking at what does success look like in Michigan? What metrics uh, should we be considering, both short and long term? What's the available state of Michigan? Uh, what's, what's available within the state of Michigan for advanced care planning facilitator conversation and training? Um, and policy barriers um, that that really kind of influence uh, the movement of uh, data that supports at, uh, uh, end of life care conversations. Next slide. And again, this is a little bit of a repeat from last time. These, this is what we we have heard, what we have learned from the experts in the field, that there are legal documents within our environment, and there are supporting documents within our environment. We heard that the most important one was really that patient advocate designation also could be called a durable power of attorney for healthcare. This identifies a surrogate decision maker, and it's intended not just to identify the who, but also to provide the contact information for who can speak for that individual. That document requires um, two witnesses, uh, uh, two witnesses signing, and uh, as well as the ac acceptance of the patient advocate who must also sign that document. Um, and it, uh, the, there's information, that one kind of piece set of information is oftentimes combined with an optional portion, which is really kind of more in that supporting range. We'll talk about that supporting information later on. The other two documents that are really kind of legal documents are out of hospital medical orders, one in the form of my post, it's a physician order for life sustaining treatment, and it directs CPR preferences and additional selected medical interventions, as well as an out of hospital DNR, and it directs the withhold holding of CPR. These are intended to change as the individual's condition changes and it's advisory only within a hospital setting, but they are considered legal documents. From all of the experts who are sitting in this space, is there anything in there that we have heard incorrectly? Silence is good. Uh, Lisa, sorry, yes, Lisa, yeah. this is Amy. I just, when I present information like this, I identify the patient advocate designation as a legal document, whereas the my post and DNRs, these are medical orders. So I know that's how it's reflected on the screen, but I'm just very specific, which is which. Okay, thank you. Michael? Yeah, so hi. Um, um, a couple of things I would say, just a reminder from last time that post is the physician orders for scope of treatment. Um, and so not exactly life sustaining. Also as a primary care doc, I would just say, um, and we'll probably be talking about it later, the great disconnect or, or difference between uh, what, are, what are actually truly orders, because I don't think even posts are really orders. There's, it's still a document that is used to help people know what somebody decided at some point in time. I would love as a former CMIO to translate those into actual orders in systems, but that doesn't exist and, and maybe that's a goal for the future. Um, but I think that's important to, to recognize. Um, so uh, the part on the you know, patient advocate designation, I think probably also gonna come up again later too, is that issue of, um, what we at Sparrow at least talked about as being a legal and valid um, designation of the patient advocate as represented by attorney, power of attorney for healthcare. And so I think with those caveats, we can you know continue to move forward. The DNR order is really, I think, problematic. It's valid as an outpatient, it's not valid as an inpatient, but it can often be recorded in EMR systems as if an advanced care planning document exists. And that, at least in the short run, can confuse providers because they'll go look for that only to discover it's not helping them. And again, I think that is part of what has created some of the less effective than we expected outcomes from some of the research on whether having an ACP document helps. For sure. Thank you so much for your feedback. Sure. 
All right, Amy, uh, I look for what is actionable by EMS out of hospital DNR, sorry, uh, and my post order are actionable. Okay, great, thank you. Next slide. Again, this is like the, the, the supporting documentation that we have kind of been, been talking about, these treatment preferences documents. We've heard that there are a variety of formats and templates. There's varying content that can be filled in. Um, there's different ways in which that uh, can be captured, whether that's in some systems, it could be a video recording. Sometimes it could be a, um, a checklist. Sometimes it could be a narrative writing out of things, but there are different forms that kind of come with it, uh, in different formats, five wishes document, treatment preferences document, right to life documents. But these are all intended to be informed uh, helping to inform a decision, not necessarily a legal document that um, that provides uh, direct guidance. Anything that we've heard incorrectly about the Michigan landscape for supporting documents? All right, next slide. So with that being said, this is where we get a chance to dive in. And again, I want folks to come off mute, come on camera. If you're comfortable, come on camera and really let's have these discussions. We are here to help serve the, the, the environment, not drive home uh, something specific. So as the health information exchange, we have heard that conversations and efforts should really focus on attaining a legal patient advocate designations. And these are some of the questions, and I want to hear from you folks. What are the barriers to completing a legal patient advocate designation? Are there any? Brandon, I see you came off mute. Does that mean yeah, you have so, I mean, I think just because of the complexity of the conversation, that's a barrier. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's maybe incentive in the right places where people can <clears throat> calmly consider, you know, uh, what would, you know, the situation really look like before they end up in the situation. So um, I know I had an incident this this week with my aunt. She's very, very ill. She's in the hospital. And, um, you know, that's what's leading me and family members to have the conversation of what, you know, my aunt's perspective is and what she would want for her care. So, so I'm hearing that it's more than just about, will you speak for me, but it's also being able to translate with that individual some values. Yep. So it's a complex discussion. Yeah, and I know in my organization, we're making an effort um, to have people fill out their advanced care planning and have the discussions, but it's just, it's tough. We, um, you know, I do other reporting and stuff and we have very few people that have actually uh, sat down and done the process with us. And, uh, you know, it's an intense um, thought. But the thing I realized this week is, you know, if you don't have it, boy, it gets more intense. <laughs> it, does. it does. And I think that there was a comment in there. And Michael, I'll be I'll be right there. Um, it looks like, um, Tracy, you said uh, there's a lack of uh, resources is a huge barrier. And Amy followed that up with that she agrees. Can you talk to me a little bit about the fact that there are um, resources within this, the environment, uh, CMS does allow um, billing to occur for those conversations. And it doesn't mean that a, a conversation has to result in uh, a, a document being completed in order to be a valid engagement. Talk to me a little bit about kind of that lack of resources. Well, I think the in reality, even though that the physicians can bill for this now, um, the, the time that it takes to have the conversation and the amount that's being reversed is is two different things. Um, it's not, I mean, it's definitely a conversation for physicians to share prognosis of their patient's illness, but I think the bulk of the work can be done by a non-provider person 
Um, and that's one of the one of the uh, what you were looking for with, regarding to billing. Um, when I talk about lack of resources, though, there's very few people who have even even know what an advanced directive is, know what the Michigan requirements are. And I would say this is true for most of our physicians, social workers, nurses, and just our community people uh, as a whole. This is not something that's included in our curriculums for any of those um, you know, interdisciplinary teams. It's just really now taking off more, I'd say in the last five years, especially in our Tri-City area. Um, I think on the west side of our state, it's been doing, it's been, um, there's been a bigger movement, but for Tri-City area where we are, I know it's probably only been the last five years we've really seen resources or heard people talking about it. Okay. Uh, Marilyn, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, I can't get my camera to work. Otherwise I would. I would love um, to see you, Marilyn and I. Yes, I know. Years. It's so nice to see you too, Lisa. So uh, for probably, let's see, this is April, I was going to say three months, but since January, I've been doing annual wellness visits here at Millican, or I'm one of the people that's doing those. So, you know, in the annual wellness visit, there is a question about uh, advanced care planning. And I tell the people, I say, really, I think that this, the most important thing about this visit is this question. And and so what I would say is kind of a barrier is sometimes people will just look at me and say, well, I've already done that. I have a will made out and everybody that needs to has a copy of it. And, you know, I, I've tried to say, you know, like, so we would like just that portion of that document that is the uh, patient advocate part. But I don't know, like that's part of, to me, what I see as a barrier right now is how do you get people to say, oh yeah, I will find my document and I will pull out of it um, that part that you want and bring it in for for you. So that that's kind of my feeling, at least right now. And I give out a lot of copies of the MyHIN advanced directive. I really like it because it's really short and to the point. Um, it It's clear in what what it's it's asking for. And, you know, I say this will help, you know, this is for selecting your patient advocate. And I also, so another thing, just I won't say any more than this, but we also have this advanced care planning workbook that I give out a lot of copies of this too. And it's like asking, you know, what are those things that are really important to you? So, you know, like if something, you know, I say to them, if, if you do, have you had these conversations with your patient advocate? Do they know, you know, not only, okay, you've already got it done, but have you had those conversations with them so they understand what you want? So I've started saying that, but I, I guess I, I do think there are barriers to actually getting the document in your hands and putting it where it needs to be. Yeah. I, I, I hear a couple of things, and I want to get to Tori and to Amy and then to Michael. Uh, I've heard a couple of things in there. Marilyn, you talked about like the differences in forms and kind of is that kind of part of the problem is that there are multiple different types of forms and they have differing kind of fields that can be filled in and bring in those treatment preferences, which may or may not be able to, patients may or may not be able to extrapolate out and be able to actively predict out what they want, but just having somebody who can speak for them and understanding from a clinician standpoint, when the rubber meets the road, who do I talk to? So I kind of heard two things in there, but I would love, I would love Amy, because I know Amy's very kind of knowledgeable on this to, to really be able to weigh in as well. Amy? Well, thank you. And I feel like I'm cutting ahead here on Tori. So I apologize for that. Um, so I, I think one of the barriers that I see is um, people get so focused on treatment preferences and not wanting to make those choices. And um, the training that myself and uh, my coworker, Kelly Perry created, we really focus on um, 
working hard to select that correct patient advocate. Um, absolutely, that patient advocate needs to know about your preferences for care, but that also needs to be an ongoing conversation um, from the time that you create your document. I just viewed one this morning from 1995. It's still a valid legal document, but we need to have those conversations throughout our time. And I think our time would be spent well if that's what we're talking to our patients about is cre creating this document, selecting someone they trust, and helping them have these conversations with their patient advocate. Um, and hopefully we're doing this with healthy people that maybe we don't need to advise about certain medical conditions that they're having. Um, I get really worried when the medical team looks at someone's patient advocate designation instead of talking to the patient who has capacity. Yeah. Um, because that you're supposed to be talking to the patient and finding out what they want now, not what they wrote about months or years ago. Um, don't waste your time while you, while you have it because patients lose capacity so quickly in the hospital. Um, and as far as resources um, around the state, I, I agree with what Tracy said earlier. Um, uh, I do believe we've done a little bit better in the last five years. Uh, here at My Michigan Health, and we're right in the center of the state, and we go up a little bit into the Sioux, we have the luxury of having um, a advanced care planning educator who, what her main focus is, is community education, educating our community partners, our community members. And um, so I think that's really helped us because uh, when we look at our health system, we've got about 30,000 folks who have a patient advocate designation. So we're right on par with the national average. We'd like to be better. Um, but we do have the health, the help of our community educator out there talking about this every week. Sure. Um, so I feel like I kind of got off track. I apologize. <laughs> Was there something else you wanted me to answer with this? No, it's all good. I want to I want to make sure that I give Michael a chance and Tori, yes. I, I recognize where you are. I want to make sure that we kind of hit our, our Michigan specific folks. So, Michael, you had a comment that you wanted to make about this. Yeah, actually, I'm, I am respectful of the time constraint we have here. So I'm just going to make a couple of comments. So some of you may know that um, I, I'm here maybe in two roles. One is um, I'm currently co-chair of the Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Hurt Services Health IT Commission. So I'm here in that capacity as a listener. So uh, the less I talk and the more I hear that, that will be better. On the other side, I am a 40 plus year primary care physician whose last three years of work has been trying to advance the, if you will, advanced care planning in the health system I work for, including integrating that with EMR systems and um, interoperability with that and other systems. So lots of things I could talk about online or offline as the group finds useful as a primary care doc. And I think I have some answers for this, but clearly we all have challenges. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna go back into my silent mode and, and um, you can call on me when you need to. And if I can't resist, I'll speak up. You know, you brought up something that I think you'll see later on down the down in the in the chain here that, you know, that idea that we're kind of like trying to flow information for ultimately for physicians to be able to have engaged conversations at the point of care at the point in time where it is most desperately needed, really making sure that we're doing this in a way that aligns with what a physician needs and not just kind of flowing information because it seems like a good theoretical idea, um, but really making sure that they are central to uh, the conversation. Um, one thing I did want to touch on, I know that we kind of have to move on to the next set of conversations, but, you know, that idea of capturing something in a legalized context, we've had some experience with this, and Van, I'd love you to be able to weigh in. I mean, there are, there are forms that we can fill out electronically. Is this something that could potentially add value, like electronic signature capture to allow documents to be able to, legal documents to be able to sign so that you're not like hand taking a, a form to somebody and asking them to sign it, but it can be done in uh, that different way. Um, Van, thoughts? I'm probably not phrasing it terribly well. Either. No, no. <clears throat> and um, I do want to recognize uh, Dr. Zarukian's comments too, um, especially around the interoperability and, and the EMR 
portions and been working through that. That's been my 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 background, my my work for the past ten years or so. Um, and and so when I look at when I when I think about this, it's also is the patient advocate information an important piece of information that should be exchanged along with what we exchange in health in NHIE today, like care teams um, for better care coordination or medications or even a result, right, for for a specific patient. So, um, yeah, that's. I'd love to hear from the group too if, if they think that's a worthwhile idea or, or something we can do. Yeah, I think, you know, <clears throat> what I'd suggest is, you know, when we are going over in the EHR, we're, we're looking at the patient's history, we're considering comorbidities, but what if we took those data points and uh, shared the what could be treatments in hospital when those comorbidities catch up to the patient you know you got afib you're not medicating appropriately it gets out of control now you're having a cva so if we had the patient's um you know perspective in the er of what or the ehr if with what they wanted in treatment courses and what their values are within, you know, like how the five wishes are breaking uh, each aspect of care down. And if we could like translate the information into something consumable for the, the hospitalist, the neuro team, all these, all the, the in-hospital people to really get them to consider the, the, person as you know the the human because you know like somebody had just pointed out you know people aren't even asking the patient uh what they want you know and i think a portion of that's because you know we're, we're we are in the hr ehr has changed how we look at medicine um it's more scientific in fact driven but we're not putting all the facts that the patient as a human would maybe need to to have in front of somebody is which is equally as important as the condition itself brandon i, I if i could follow up on that thank you for sharing your perspective i i think lat in our last conversation too i, I think in in the scenario you provided what if what if there was an advocate that the healthcare provider could to then connect to at the time right if 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 like you mentioned if if the healthcare providers aren't looking at those uh, those questions, or there's issues in getting that documentation, or there's a change in in that because that advanced directive was done last year. You, you know, does having the advocate there, or having someone that you can, you know, ask on behalf of that individual patient, would that be helpful, or or move in the in, in the areas that ultimately we want to get to? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and, and the patient, you know, eh, especially like the experience I ha I'm having over this this week, um, you know, my my aunt, she's getting older. She's had a lot of health issues. She's was you know a diabetic for long term. Um, she has been amazing in managing her diabetes, but you know it's catching up, and she's got you know stents and stents and all this stuff, but. You know, sometimes um, we had an issue this this week with um, the neuro team didn't want to uh, mask any new signs and symptoms because she's having a, a CVA, and um, she ended up developing this weird pain out of nowhere. And I mean, she was just in so much pain that she was like flying all over the bed. And what ended up happening was the neuro team was so concerned about, you know, their assessment, even though there was, even if she would have gotten worse, we've already exhausted all the treatment. So that assessment is no longer, it has no impact, you know, and they were refusing to give meds for a long time. And, um, you know, that just didn't really follow her value set because, you know, like I said, if it was going to get worse, there was no treatment other than, you know, making her a little more comfortable. So, um, 
Yeah, valuing what we're doing for for the patient, not just because it's a protocol or whatever, is, is super valuable. You know, because in and we we ended up having this amazing nurse that really had advocated, and and that pain was uh, coming from this, you know her legs are happened to be ischemic, and we didn't realize that because she had more clots. You know, and uh, yeah, so it's it's valuing the person uh, and not just you know at the level that you can um, uh, practice that. And, you know, we don't always need the most advanced medicine. We, sometimes we just need, you know, guidance in, in how to fulfill, you know, those other aspects of life where you're getting to that age of, you know, we, we all realize we're going to die at some point. So, you know, that's why this conversation is super great. And I appreciate you guys. Thank, thank you so much, Brandon. Sadly, we need to move on because there's much more that we have to talk about. Um, I'm hearing some really good things. I'm hoping Lauren and team are out there capturing all of your good comments. Know that every single comment, every chat is coming into uh, the thoughts as we kind of move forward. Can we move on to the next slide? So from our previous conversations, what we heard is that treatment preferences documents are not valuable in terms of being able to accurately predict what someone might want later on down the line that the current that there that there is a movement to capture more meaningful living and treatment wishes differently more in the form of those value statements but yet that is not as widespread or in a standardized format as yet that's what we heard. Some of the questions that we had that to help us kind of suss this conversation out more fully is, if current supporting documentation, those five wishes documents, the formats that they're in right now, is not seen as valuable in serious illness conversations, should MyHIN continue to store and move these documents about the environment? Should there be, would different tools allow supporting information like treatment wishes to be captured electronically, to be able to be moved interoperably? Um, you can see the, the questions here, but I'd love to kind of uh, start that conversation thread. And I vaguely saw Amy Bailey saying something in here. This was more in the... Um, uh, patient advocate conversation, I believe. I, so tell me, pick us off somebody about your treatment preferences document. The, the formats that we have currently have been shown to not necessarily be able to capture people's information. Do you want CPR? Do you want a, a breathing tube? Do you want a feeding tube? Those kinds of things. And I, again, through some limited conversation with actual physicians have said that it is so specific that there is very limited use to that data because that specificity is really 95% of the time not applicable to the conversation that that individual is in at that point in time. So that the value statements, understanding the values that people hold, um, might hold greater um, greater uh, value to the to the care team member who's actually having the conversation. Can somebody talk to me about those thoughts if you differ then great bring that up as well you know i would i would say that it would be nice if um we had the ability to make maybe more of these documents more legally helpful you know um because i, I see what the provider would be saying like if i'm talking about cpr but we're we're not actively doing it and, and then that becomes you know just a uh you know, a thought when they're, when it does come in. So, I mean, that would be helpful to, to know if a person wants CPR or not, because you don't want to do CPR on somebody that doesn't want that. But to, to make like some of these other documents more legally binding. And, you know, I felt like to go back to my example, I felt like if I was able to take some of that responsibility from the, the neuro team, and, and and my my family could have taken some of that responsibility and said, hey, like we get what you're trying to do, we appreciate it, but really just we need to you know manage this 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 person in a, in a 
dire issues that she's having now that we understand that the the clock could, you know, make things worse. Um, I think that would be helpful. And I think that would get the providers to feel a little more comfortable and not you know, because I think in school, you're really kind of pushed to take it to the, the the highest level possible to do exhaust everything you have, but not all people want that, you know. It's, it's interesting. Thank you, Brandon. And I see Dr. Uh, Zarukian, do you want to walk through your comment? Yeah, so sure. So, you know, the experience I've had both as a medical educator and as a primary care doc is very much in the world of it depends, right? So you can talk and you can even look at, we use five wishes, right? So it, it's pretty clear that it says, basically, if this is futile, if you're never going to regain consciousness, if you're never going to have a meaningful life in the future, this theoretical, you know, thing that you can't really relate to compared to when you have renal failure or you've had a stroke or whatever, um, it's easy to say what your inclination is, and I think that can indeed help inform a conversation with that person if they're still able and competent to have it, but then you don't need the advanced directive, right? It just helps inform goals of care. When a person can't speak for themselves, um, and again, I think probably many, if not all of us, have been in that circumstance in one way or another with a loved one, um, it can be really reassuring to know what were their preferences the last time they could express them. And in some of my other messages um, in the chat, it's that whole notion of, well, when was the last time this was discussed? Did you actually get a clear answer? Does this relate to that, to that answer? Have you had a subsequent, what we would use as goals of care conversation, right? So now you have stage four cancer. You have an advanced directive. It's got these general principles, but what are your goals of care? given where you are today, and when combined with advanced directives, that can be helpful. So I was very conscious of looking for goals of care type documentation or conversations in the research literature that, that you, you shared with us, which I greatly appreciate, or in the, in the webinars, but that seems to be kind of missing. And so that again might be part of our um, thought process as we move forward is what might be the relationship between a fairly static advanced directive kind of document, which stays general in part because it gives you more flexibility and then more specifics that help the surrogate, um, the, the patient advocate once designated, a better sense of knowing, well, what did your mom feel the last time we talked about it? And oh, by the way, the last time we talked about it was two weeks ago. And sure. that's pretty recent. Yeah. So the, the so uh, in one of the conversations with Dr. Roman Baratza up at uh, Munson, um, he's actually kind of implementing a new tool that he's trying to kind of move out that really kind of uh, allows a different level of capture and a, and a spectrum of answers, not just yes, no, that really help to kind of delineate. And I just wonder... Um, uh, Munson uses the Making Choices Michigan form, but Dr. Roman Barraza, who is the head of their hospice and palliative care, has actually developed an internal tool that helps them outline uh, differently um, uh, a, uh, a value statement about treatment preferences that he finds uh, much more uh, informative and in, in, in both to patients as well or to family members as well as to care teams who have to ultimately help guide those conversations with uh with uh patient uh designates um so uh, so i'm hearing kind of uh some differences in there that there are still some value to being able to walk through those conversations um, because of the differences in how that information is captured, anywhere from narrative to video to different forms to yes, no questions that may have a variety or, or a limited number of applications, um, that the forms might be a little bit of a, of a problem. Is there, um, is there anybody who's out there who's championing this work to kind of understand kind of what those new things are? Like, who's doing that work? Is it organization by organization? Is there a need to do it at a statewide level? And there probably is a need. And it'd be nice if we could come up with ideas, too, that would really give us an 
you know, like, like the values you're saying of the patient, it'd be nice if we had like some sort of, um, like a, I keep wanting to say psyche val, but that's not the exactly the what I'm going for. But like, you know, a series of questions that would give you an idea of the values and principles that that patient holds uh, most important, you know, pain management, quality of life, um, and so on and so forth to, to really give providers uh, that don't know the patients. Um, that'd be, that'd be a good tool, I think. Okay, great. Anybody else? I want to, I want to make sure that we're giving everybody an opportunity to really kind of weigh in. Um, there's lots of folks on this conversation. Please feel free to jump in. Trevor, I, I'm going to pick on you because you kind of wanted to jump into this conversation. Tre Trevor Youngquist, I don't know if you have any thoughts about these things. Hi, um, I Hi. don't actually. Um, so I'm from Sparrow Care Network, the physician organization of Sparrow. And I think there's the appetite to kind of uh, plug into this space more, give it that uh, being part of a ACO, there's post acute quality of care that we'd love to be able to coordinate from this work. So I think like Dr. Zeruki and I'm just kind of listening. That's the hat that I have on. So I appreciate you uh, bringing me in though. Sorry, <laughs> I like to pick on people for sure. Um, uh, again, coming, coming. So I've been hearing that there might be some some folks. Who else is doing this? Like it, like I think there was like this major push in the very beginning. Like, hey, we've got to get on board with like the whole advanced care planning thing. The whole country went down this pathway. Making choices, Michigan, and respecting choices kind of came into the the space. It works for some; it doesn't work for others. Is there a need for further standardization of this work, of approaches and process related work that is going on, as well as the tools in which we are that are are are, are capturing the information? Is that something that should be undertaken at a different level? And who would the, who would be the right champion? Anyone have a thought on that? I'll, I'll just jump in. I think we're going to be really challenged to have a standard for all of this. I'm going to put in the chat actually a, an article that was co-authored by Dr. Tulski in the Up to Date app that I've been using at Sparrow for a couple of years and put it into the EMR system as a documentation template for serious and not even necessarily end of life, but serious condition conversations related to goals of care that I think could be one example. Different examples may work over time and the answers to all of them, even if they're not standardized with each other are still super helpful to share with each other. Um, so that, that's something you can look for in the chat. Sure. And I think that as we kind of like look to this as the health information exchange, being able to kind of move information that is in a non-standardized format certainly presents some level of complexity. Then we're kind of like, how do we do that? How is that information utilized? How do end users actually uh, access that information and make sense of it in a way if it's not in a standardized format? Um, Dr. Zeruki, and you, we talked about this earlier and that's where I'm like, hey, if physicians are primarily responsible for having serious illness conversations, should physicians um, be engaged, not necessarily like drive it forward, but be engaged in the longer term efforts to alter the current state to something that's more functional in the state of Michigan? I know that it's hard yeah, to want to engage these really, really scarce resources, but sometimes they we can spin our wheels going around them. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think the, the role of physicians um, has to be as always the leader of this is important enough to do. Here's the why behind the what. Here's how we can make it feel safe to try to answer these questions. Here's your role. Here's your family's role. Here's what I need to do. To Amy's point, what's the most important thing? You know, it's not necessarily all the answers to questions that may change, but 
the answer to the one that's the most critical and the most durable, and when that is, who do you trust the most to make decisions for you when you cannot, right? Everything else is a snapshot in time with regard to what you, your current thoughts are on that. She's also exactly right. Even when I've had people who have absolutely valid documents, it sometimes takes me six visits in a row before they actually finally get it to me or bring it in. Um, and so all of those sorts of things, I think, combine together. There's absolutely no question that this task, if you will, can be delegated. Although I'll say, you know, I do Medicare wellness, advanced care planning, and follow-up of chronic conditions for a single patient in a 40-minute visit. Now, that's kind of a long visit, but for three different things, one of which um, is a billable ACP type discussion, that's a pretty remunerative thing. And remembering you don't actually have to end up with an end of, with an advanced directive. You can take chips away of it at a time. And if you can automate that in your EMR, so the patient is answering most of the questions yes. related to Medicare wellness, and you can focus your conversation on, here's why I need this document. And what I really need for now is to know who, not necessarily yes. all the what's. That can, I think, allow us to decrease the inertia to getting it done. And it allows you also to delegate this to people who are not physicians. All, they, all the patient really, really needs from the doctor is endorsement. And any questions answered about you know, whether that puts you know, at them at increased risk of not getting the care they need, et cetera, stuff they, they trust their doctor to answer. Or their I, other professional you know, could be an NPPA, et cetera. Agree. I really, really appreciate how you how you uh, stated that. And now I I just blanked out on it, but it was about inertia, reducing the inertia to this. I think is a huge um, thing that speaks to the um, what people have talked about before, which is the resources necessary um, to devote to it. If we can decrease the inertia of of getting to that work, um, great feedback. Great feedback. Um, continue to pop your um, your comments, threads into the chat, um, but we do need to move on. Can we go to the next slide? This is something that we heard, and again, uh, we'll go over this, but what we heard was that different care environments have different needs. And that when we talk about things from a hospital-based perspective, we wanna make sure that there are different areas that also may have different needs within this. I would love to see if there's anyone in the space that represents the opinion of a skilled nursing facility or anyone who represents um, uh, the audience for EM or EMS services. Because again, these are kind of other, other states have uh, had different solutions that have put in place, not seeing anyone. Uh, that is raising their hand saying, yay, I, I work for this. Is there anyone here? Oh, there we go. Is it Orist? Is that, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, it is Orist. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for being able to join us. So can you talk to us a little bit about kind of like the skilled nursing perspective and maybe some of these questions that, that we had about skilled nursing facilities and, and how you utilize these documents? So I was in long-term care for a while. I kind of uh, went, um, went and did value-based medicine for a while. Now I'm coming back into the, into the skilled nursing care environment once again. Um, so I've served a medical director at a facility for over 18 years uh, previously. So it's it's a I mean this is a really good conversation you know there is that lot of resistance patients um, um, I agree that I think the the major thing is identifying that power of attorney to help make decisions is, is really the key um, and that's probably the path of least resistance <laughs> um, I had mentioned it earlier just I, I like the whole um, my post document it was something that's been following for all my my whole career trying to get that to be in place um, but it is difficult to get that all completed. Uh, but if it is in place, it really makes the physician's life much easier and the family can more easily um, agree this is what mom or dad or forever had wanted when they were alive. Um, it helps the whole goals, goals of care planning. Um, um, can you talk fun. to me a little bit about the My Post document? How frequently do you see My Post documents change? Um, well, yeah, not, not often enough. <laughs> 
Um, but they're intended to change as that person's condition changes? They, they are. So, I mean, it, it is kind of more meant to, it's more more timely for, for people actually in a nursing home setting, only because they are kind of, in a way, um, in a declining state, if you will. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of nursing home care, if it's a long-term care setting, is more of a palliative care in nature as it is. Uh, they have lots of cor you know comor comorbidities, a lot of chronic diseases, and managing them, you know, curing is not something that's possible. Um, so, get, getting a DNR in place is definitely um, probably more easily done. Uh, but the goals of care becomes a different different conversation, much more difficult. So, at least at least annually, we try to do that. Um, but after every hospitalization, it's always worthwhile to come back and re-explore that after this has, has hospitalization. You know, sure. are our goals changing? Yeah. And somehow being able to do that more and more regularly and somehow be, actually be able to somehow incentivize that conversation would be helpful too. Sure. And this, gosh, um, you said a couple of things here. And one I wanted to get to was like this idea. So if you're getting an out of hospital DNR, something that is functioning within a skilled nursing facility, once that person, if should that person have to transfer to the emergency department or to the hospital, is there value to being having that information flow electronically to a hospital if if it's advisory only at that point in time? Is it is are we overcoming a process? problem to be able to move that information from a stable care environment like a skilled nursing facility to a, a more acute environment. And if they come back from the hospital, do those same documents have to be revisited and recreated? I, I, I honestly have no idea. So, you know, in my experiences, unfortunately, a lot of things get lost in that transfer between the nursing home and, and the hospital. Uh, despite the nursing home spending a lot of time actually making sure all the documents go with the patients, some of those documents do get caught up somewhere with with EMS and never make it to the emergency room physician. So having them available somewhere, you know, um, uh, in a depository <laughs> uh, with my in would be really helpful. Um, um, So yes, somewhere electronically having that be able to you know be available to the providing doctors at the hospital really would be helpful. Um, do do the physicians on the other end of the spectrum um, require the document in order to kind of broach that conversation? And this we may not have the the right people on the phone to be able to to answer that question. Like we like from a skilled nursing facility, there's value. Amy, you you probably run kind of like uh, this. Is there from what I hear from our emergency um, physicians, they still need consent or refusal of care. And I would like to highlight that um, I worry that uh, if a skilled nursing facility DNR is not sent with the patient or at um, the best thing would be electronically, we can't um, count on our patient advocate having received that DNR, their own copy of their DNR to know that that was the choice of their loved one a month ago, right before they lost capacity. So I know that for our emergency department, when they have someone come in and they see the DNR, they're still trying to get a hold of that patient advocate um, because it was created in the skilled nursing facility. Um, just to confirm that that's what the choice is, because we need consent. So those can, are those are very valid barriers. Yeah. Can can somebody tell me if if somebody goes to the hospital, does the DNR get have to be redone? Or, and I think about this from an information kind of making sure that the current version is constantly in place. Dr. Zurukian. Yeah, unfortunately, um, every out, out of hospital DNR has, is not valid in the hospital. As soon as you hit the ED, it's gone. You have to reestablish. And if you cannot get a hold of the patient advocate who is then comfortable telling you 
no matter what was said out there, no matter what DNR document there is out there, it's advisory as was said, you know, it, it gives you a sense of what the last time the patient had an opinion about it doesn't necessarily tell you given the context of what's happening today, we yeah. shouldn't resuscitate if things go bad. And it's always gonna come back to the question of, well, if, if I were to code here, um, would I be revivable? You know, is this short-term or long-term? Is this my chronic illness or an acute reversible thing? And again, in the absence of the no, that's why the most important thing to, is who speaks for the patient and can I reach them, right? And if you can't, everybody's a code. So I'm going to, I'm going to say this out loud because I'm just a big mouth. Um, if it all comes down to being able to speak with the, the individual who speaks for the patient and everything up until then is an advisory only. If we, if there is, and I'm, it, if we spend the time, because the lift to be able to get to flowing documents that are intended to change throughout the environment. There's a big lift that it takes to be able to make that happen, manage the version control, get the process in place so that everybody's doing that. If we're doing all of that work, does it detract from the real work of having informed conversations and, and really driving towards the patient advocate designation? And it's truly a question, but I'm just putting it out there. Somebody. Well, I'll be happy to kick it off and then get other reactions. I, I would say that was largely the point of Dr. Tulski's comment, right? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is who speaks for this patient and can I reach them? Once that's the case, you would still talk to that person to say, I know what's in this advanced directive, the patient that I wouldn't want to have um, chest compressions, but you decide right? That, that person who, and all it does is it helps to decrease the likelihood of a family feud, for example, when people disagree, because you can say, but your son, your oldest son was designated as the person who gets to decide. So I think you're right. I think uh, robust, more real time, you know, to many of the comments that were here, um, even, even a, a a uh, post form, which I love. I mean, I was trying to implement that at Sparrow as well. It's that once a year update, and I would much rather be able to see that happen at every office visit if that's relevant, especially in oncology, but really anywhere else that's chronic disease management. Um, if things change, this is what the patient would want. So um, so long answer to a short question, but, but I think that's exactly right. In practical terms, it's about who gets to speak for the patient, what are they saying? Do they have questions? And if if so, we go from there. And if in doubt, or if there's a if there's a debate that's not easily resolved, doctors will end up doing more than they might otherwise. And I think that's part of what we're trying to tackle. Great feedback. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to move on and see. Does anybody here represent EMS? Because we haven't talked about EMS yet. Because there's there's a lot of different things that can happen. And certainly other states have taken us in that space. Is there anyone here? Pipe up if you're uh, if you're an EMS or can speak to the EMS environment. I was a paramedic for a long time. Great. Who is this? Sorry. Brandon. Hi, Brandon. So um so when when you go to the field and um if they have like a DNR order or my post order or something in the space, um you know, that's that that gives you clear direction. Um, can you give a sense as to how many times, like what percentage of individuals when you receive calls where a legal document might have provided you a, a different path, like and and how that would impact that individual's care if you had a different document or something that provided you that clear guidance? Yeah, I mean. It, any, you know, knowledge is power. So, you know, providing people with what they want is, is super important. So yeah, it definitely, if I have a signed document that says I do not want um, chest compressions, we, we always honored that. Every ER I've worked at, the outside DNR, we, we honored all of them. Um, so well, that's what percentage of calls though? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, that's 
that's a huge, I mean, in one six month period, one time I remember working 16 cardiac arrests. So I have no idea how many, um, yeah, that's a long life, but it, it definitely has a lot of influences. And, um, and an earlier question you uh, asked about who, who should be doing uh, some of this uh, work. Uh, I used to work for Life EMS and they, uh, and EMR, AMR, they've all created um, uh, community care uh, networks as well. Uh, I know Life has Tandem 360, I think, it, and they work with um, uh, nursing home or not uh, home nurses to to kind of fill needs of you know delegate that work out. So there's a consideration, and if if it was electronic and it went the uh, DNR went to um, the computer, you know, and we could check that, that would make a world of difference because I do, I have come up to lots of people that said, I have a DNR, but I don't have it with me. And that's yeah. a big, you know, because if you don't have it with you, you don't have it. It doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. Could I follow up on that, Lisa, really oh, quickly? Of course, please. So, um, you know, it, it I'm an engineer, so I'm just thinking through the scenario. And so from your from that perspective of, okay, so I've been called to respond to a household. Would you then look up, okay, this household has these individuals there and which I don't even know if they exist or not, but here are their DNRs or here are those documents. Because I'm just thinking about the timing, you know, coming, you know, trying to respond and you know, as quickly as possible in an emergency situation, but then having enough time to then say, wait, there is a DNR here, so I'm not going to, you know, do chest compressions. Yeah, it, it, I can see it's hard to imagine. So say I get called nine, yeah. you know, 911, uh, you always have, it, well, you don't always have, when they're, when they're, the communication goes out to like, hey, I need these resources at this house. Typically what happens is, um, you know, a, Paramedic, paramedic unit is dispatched, but also a fire department, which that could be really, really important in this conversation because, you know, as if I get there first, just because I'm fast, I got a smaller vehicle, you know, I can start my medical treatment and get the demographics because demographics are, you know, we try to get those first, but I'll be honest, I forgot sometimes but when you have fire departments coming in and assisting with those types of actions, you know, usually somebody will start talking to a family member, somebody will start getting medications, somebody will start getting the paperwork if there is legal paperwork that needs to go with them. So really, if you had access to fire department with that information, that that might be like really big and, you know, stop the issue of like, I started CPR on somebody that didn't want it. Yeah, I, I think about those things. And I just think about kind of like, as Van was saying, the timing of those things, stopping and being and making sure that you've got the right individual. Um, you know, I, I think even in, within the EMRs, when individuals would come into the the uh, the space. Oftentimes, we didn't necessarily couldn't match them appropriately with like a, a positive ID. Um, super interesting conversation. Super interesting conversation. Um, other things about kind of different care environments that we need to highlight during this conversation. All right, I'm going to take that as it's time to move on to the next, the next slide. Thank you so much for everyone's engagement. Um, the next one we heard, and of course it was brand new to me. Um, what we heard was that Michigan has some policies and requirements that represent barriers, barriers to serious illness conversations and care. Um, one of those things uh, that I heard, that we heard, was the, that we do not have a lack of, or that we have no next of kin law. And the ramifications of that were much different than I thought that they would be, that there was, um, that within hospital, you can speak with the next of kin. Um, 
that once that individual is set to leave the hospital, that uh, the, the decision-making capacity, unless there is a specific patient advocate designation in place, that there are, um, there's no way that you can talk to the next of kin and assume that they are the, 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 the surrogate decision maker. Um, and that that has long lasting implications for trying to move people out of hospital once something, their care has it kind of progressed to the point where they cannot speak for themselves, that they have to stay in hospital so that decision making can happen and petition the state to get um, some type of patient advocate document in place. I would ask, are there negatives? What are the negatives to having a next of kin law? Can you give an example of what a next of kin law is somewhere else that has one? Uh, I think, uh, actually, somebody who's probably, Amy, you're probably far more <laughs> knowledgeable to talk about this than I am. Well, um, so in Michigan, with regards to making medical decisions for someone else, there is no next of kin law for the state. Individual health systems can create their own next of kin um, policy. Ours begins with whoever the patient has identified as their trusted decision maker, which doesn't need to be a family member. Um, if we don't have that, then we go to spouse, adult children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I've worked with many patients for whom uh, talking to their next of kin, like their son or something like that, would be devastating with regards to the care that they were to receive if they didn't have capacity to make their own choices because people just didn't get along with their families or they have a significant other of 20 years that they trust. But as soon as they leave our health system, that significant other cannot continue to participate in those decisions for care for that patient. Um, I hope that that makes sense. It does, it does. So I, I hear that one negative might would be that um, people are able to make decisions for people that they really shouldn't be able to or are not people that they want to make a decision. Is there is there some sense as to how frequently like that scenario comes up. I, I, I always think about an 80-20 and I know that I that sounds very, very draconian and awful because even one time where it, it uh, kind of impacts a person would be devastating to that individual, but understanding kind of what, how frequently this situation arises. I'll, I'll just say this is, this is an orist. Um, I, I've just seen it happen too many times, even under under even in, in hospice care, uh, even within a facility or a home, um, uh, there is no patient advocate. Uh, family, the family that's there um, may not really know the patient, but they are making some decisions and sometimes there are some battles. But I've had patients who definitely are end of life. Um, really, hospice is very, very appropriate for them. There's nothing more we can do. And they get hospitalized uh, because there's no surrogate decision maker to make sure they can be a DNR if they're going to die at the facility that coming week. And so they go to the hospital to die, which is not their home. They've been at this facility for over a year. The, the staff there know that patient. They, you know, that is their home. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of facilities don't feel comfortable to keep them there because they fear family may have a squabble. Maybe there's one person outlying, you know, five ch children, four are in agreement, one isn't, and becomes an issue. Um, um, but sometimes everybody is on the same page and they all want comfort care and the facility sometimes won't keep them there because they're fearful still of somebody else coming out and saying, this is not what was wanted. Uh, and there's just no laws protecting that. They have a- so, so would a patient, would a next of kin law impact that specific situation for the better? I'm sorry, I mean- Would hear. having a next of kin law impact that situation that you just described for the better? I think in most, I think most time it would. And again, I, I've definitely had, had patients also who, who definitely, if they had a choice, they would, they would choose their neighbor or a best friend as opposed to their children 
uh, for decision making because they know within the within the kids they also may have some arguments of what what's best. And I've had patients pretty much to tell me they they don't think the kids would carry out their wishes. Okay. So does but they know their neighbor of, best. Friend. Sorry, go ahead. Does do the the two I'm hearing um, that the two oh. are not necessarily kind of one or the other, but maybe things that can work in concert with each other. And Summer, I just see that you added something. Please jump in and be able to weigh in. Sorry, I have a very hard time kind of <laughs> monitoring chat functions. I'm so sorry. Oh, I was just adding, because um, I, I, do, I do inpatient palliative care, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I think it happens more frequently than what people think. Honestly, if I had to estimate, it's probably 25 to 30% of people in our population that would choose someone other than their next of kin that this next of kin law would cover. But in the same token, I, I see where we have patients in the hospital a couple months because we have no decision maker and we're holding up beds and we have patients in the ER that are holding for days. So I, I think there's good and bad to it. I think it would help resolve that issue, but would it be the it might give people more incentive to fill out an advanced directive and appoint the person that they want if we did have a next of kin law, just plain devil's advocate there. So it could they could work in concert with each other. So continuing the 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 focus on trying to get patient advocate designations in place, but having um, uh, understanding kind of the impact that having the ability to transition to um, a next of kin law, maybe Amy. So I have found that um, individuals will have no hesitation in sharing with me who they trust as their decision maker, which could or could not be someone blood related to them, but they have hesitation in creating their patient advocate designation document. So if we were to have a next of kin law in Michigan, I would hope that the first person that would be considered is anyone that we have um, heard from patient, either verbally or in writing as to who they trust. It could be the neighbor, their coworker, or it could be their spouse, something like that. That's what I would hope for a next of kin law if we were to have one. Great. I, I agree, Amy, that would be really helpful. Okay. Yeah, I agree as well, yeah. Okay. Does that, I, I'm, I'm not as aware of kind of like the different efforts. I've heard that there have been different efforts to kind of get a next of kin law and they've kind of all been shut down. I don't understand kind of like the political issues that really kind of factor into what, like bringing this conversation to light. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. All right, witnessing and signature requirement laws. Um, how can we make those documents more accessible to patients? So if you have people who live a long ways away, you can get them kind of the information captured in the right way. Um, uh, is there anything that can be done to simplify the witnessing and signature law requirements? Again, I really have no idea. I've just heard that, you know, the more times you have to have somebody kind of sign up a legal document that, you know, there's complexity. Uh, Dr. Zarukian. Yeah, I, I made some comments earlier about the electronic part since people do so much of their business online, but I, I wanted to make sure we get into the parking lot at least one thing. Sure. Um, when I talk to patients about whether they have an advanced directive and they say no, I ask them, have you ever gone to a lawyer and established like a trust for your family or anything? And do you know if they happen to carve out a part for healthcare? Because very often they will throw in a a templated advanced directive for durable power for healthcare, and they go, I don't know, or the answer turns out to be yes. 
And so I think one of the things that we might want to include in this is that notion potentially of asking, but I would even take it another step further, which is to say, if attorneys go to the bother of helping us with this by helping their clients create these documents, could we also then have a process by which they can send it to, for example, my hin with the individual's request and we have just killed two birds with one stone. And, and there is, I believe, Van, Van Lee, come on. I, I believe that actually the people who, who largely upload documents are coming from law firms. I don't, yeah, I don't know if it's largely, but yeah, there's definitely lar um, law firms that, that do that. But um, to your point, that does work. And I, I think I want to investigate that further, right? I mean, talking to them and understanding their, their perspective as well. Um, great point. Yeah, I think ba based on the frequency with which my patients yeah. I have not have not had this come automatically, I, I can say at least in terms of our hands, it never happened. Mm -hmm. um, in terms in terms of my own personal case, it also didn't happen. I had to grab it yeah. from the signed version with the signatures from my attorney and get them over to Sparrow so I wouldn't have to create the thing over again. And, and by the way, I should finish the um Kind of the workflow again is it, once they send it to us, our, our aim is then to make it available, right, to to the network of providers as well. So, um, we, which is um, that's one of the reasons they are using using my hand. But but either way, I want to investigate that. You know, talk yeah, to them in, in which case there's then a messaging issue that should go back to the health systems that are yeah. sending information so that they know that you have a piece of treasure there that they don't know about. Great Great point. Great point. So, and, and that kind of just triggered something in my brain. When we're talking about hiring lawyers and so on and so forth, that really kind of assumes that people have the wherewithal or the ability to kind of go down that legal pathway. And, and potentially, if it's complicated enough of a process to get that patient advocate designation, does this kind of uh, disenfranchise further um, some of our most vulnerable individuals where this might be um, even more impactful. Anyone have a thought to that? Not sure I understood your question completely, but I think one of the pieces are, can we provide legal services to people that help tie this together and meet their needs? So low cost legal services. For those who already do this as part of their, their planning and their use of the legal system already, it's simply an issue of making sure we're capturing the good work that those people do. Sure, and I I a hundred percent agree with that. I think I think my question was really like, when we have you know ultimately three or four signatures that need to be captured, we live in an environment where people are kind of all over the place. Is that um, kind of that double witnessing? All of that. Is there anything that can be done to simplify the process that make? the process less complicated for those who don't necessarily have resources to hire lawyers and help them walk through the process. So uncomplicating that patient advocate designation. I don't know if that's even physically possible, um, but is it something that could be investigated or should be investigated? Is just the fact that we have to create this legal document and what it takes to create that legal document part of the problem? Yeah, so again, from my perspective, DocuSign is in a, a great example of electronic legally binding signatures that can that can be used for this or any other example of a, of a secure document signing with legal um, support. Okay. I find it challenging that that um, like let's say in the hospital environment, um, employees of the hospital, regardless if they're on the medical team or even have a role that is related to medical care, cannot sign as a witness for our patients. And especially during COVID, when we couldn't even have visitors or volunteers in our health system, we had no one to witness these documents for our patients. Um, same goes for some of our individuals that live in more remote areas, um, which I cover for hospice, home care, um, 
those individuals that just don't have friends that or or are employed. So we really need to do um, a better job in serving our communities and allowing more individuals to witness. Um, I can witness an out of hospital DNR order, but I cannot witness a um, patient advocate designation. And this is, uh, forgive my absolute ignorance, is this a legal policy? Yeah, it's in our state in law. Okay. Okay. So yep. that's something, okay. So that's something that could be potentially addressed. Yes. That. And we did address it a couple of years ago um, through testimony to the HIT commission. Okay. Um, I can't remember if it was in 2020 or 2021, but it was right before the holidays. And a few of us testified um, and provided those examples. And so I'm not sure what impact that has made. I know the state has a lot on its plate, but we I can find the dates if anybody needs them. I just have to do a little look, looking. If you, if you could, that would be great. Certainly for my knowledge, it would be great. And certainly as we kind of look forward to kind of like what recommendations we're hearing surface, that would be great to have. Um, all right, how are we, I think, I think I agree with Amy. Another common error patients make is that they have their patient advocates. The first alternate sign is witnesses, which is not allowed. And then it makes an otherwise valid document. Yes. Okay. So lots of, lots of feedback coming in on, um, on the idea of policy. Um, I believe anything else that before we leave this topic and move to the next one, anything else that we really want to make sure that we like get the feedback in there about um, policy barriers. All right, then let's move to the next one is, uh, team, tell me where we are. Do we have one or two more slides to go through? My team. Looks like we have a couple and then like just closing ones. Okay, um, so this one, uh, what we heard. Ah, uh, yes, this is my favorite one. Um, there are many organizations throughout the state which already do training and facilitation of serious illness conversations. This, this is really about kind of feedback on the Making Choices Michigan through the Michigan Health Information Network. Remember that the Michigan Health Information is Network, that we are the movers of data. Um, and through kind of uh, some, some merging of organizations, Making Choices Michigan was, was adopted underneath the MyHin um, brand as, a, as, a, as an arm of the work that we do. Is there, and, and what, um, what work is going on, is there a need in the state for a lead entity to bring uh, interested and impacted entities together to rethink strategy on advanced care planning and serious illness conversations? There's a multitude of folks who do this within their own organizations, potentially regionally. Is there a need to do this at a larger level? I think adding incentive um, for people to do these trainings, although they're available, um, finding the time to do them. And um, I think providers would be more likely if it was there was no cost and it was made convenient for them. Like, oh, this is an incentive from the state. We want to focus on having these conversations, you know, as long as maybe how we have a, a pain requirement with our licensing. I don't know, that's a that's a far stretch, but something along those lines. Okay. So I'm hearing kind of something from a from a state directive perspective. And would the goal be to have conversations that result in the all important the, the patient advocate designation is that the 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 goal of this um, larger kind of lead entity is to to drive those changes. I think that's an achievable goal. <laughs> 
probably the best at this point. I'm sorry, Oris, you're kind of breaking up on me. Is anybody else hearing the breakup? Or is that just me? It could be me. I was hearing it too. I, I would say I would I would agree with you. I think having that uh, a patient advocate designation is just probably um, the best goal to have for us right now. Okay. Is there um, so a lot of different organizations do these this the training and the facilitation of serious illness conversations? Is there one that stands out as kind of somebody who can champion some of this work? So if I could jump in, let me just make one suggestion. Just again, the comment on keeping the main thing the main thing. I think the moment we start to get into the weeds about what you start to want or don't want after you've made the advocate designation, the more you're gonna get some combination of non-uniformity and valid reasons for people to take different approaches. What I think I've heard is, and what I think from the other materials you sent out was, everybody agrees that having a patient advocate designated helps with the, the process overall and probably would be a good bang for the buck for the state to at least endorse and try to help encourage whether we need a different strategy for that i think is all in the method you know and, and again reasonable people may disagree but they might want to convene for example a conference on so let's hear from lots of different organizations who have made progress with their advanced care planning you know one of my favorite examples of that was jen eric's you know from spectrum now corwell um, where they put in a big effort to try to improve that um, as well so um I think the key issue is with, with all the possible goals that could lie within that, do we want to think about keeping it simple and making a straightforward, doable request? In, in other words, what's a legal valid ACP document and how do we have more of them in the system? You just said a mouthful. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, the, the keeping it simple part. And I and I appreciate your comment on kind of the more we get into the weeds, it allows for a division in how that conversation unfolds and, and specific positions and, and uh direction is as to how it should or could happen. Um, whereas the idea of keeping it very simple with just kind of obtaining a patient advocate designation and then focusing in on who's finding success in being able to do that. So I'm hearing state leadership uh, to some degree, and I'm hearing keeping it simple and continuing to focus solely on, um, on obtaining a patient advocate designation. And, and I think that this is going to start to lead into our next slide. Is there anybody else who wants to say anything further about this specific piece? I guess I would like I would like to add in I might have a different perspective of just because of what I do I, I'm in the hospital I'm in these crisis situations with patients and families and I frequently will have patients and families that have designated someone and they still have no idea what to do I mean there's still that what would they want in this situation and it's still very difficult even if they've completed an advanced directive so I think as part of our education, it's change, you know, talking about these serious illness conversations upstream so that they have an understanding of their disease process. The family understands their disease process and the patient knows what, what might come up in the future and how they're going to deal with that. So I think, you know, that upstream education on top of and, the advanced directive in appointing a decision maker is is crucial for any sort of success in this. Um, this is Tracy. Um, I, I do work with Summer and not being partial at all, um, but would completely agree with that uh, comment. Um, I was an ICU nurse for 25 years, and I cannot tell you how many times I'd look to somebody and say, you're the named decision maker, and I knew there was, they would just say there was no conversation. Um, so we're in the same, the same boat. So 
going back to um, the the video and some of the literature that has really come on, is that a matter of being able to more adequately prepare um, people who have those serious illness conversations, preparing them in a different way that could um, allow the decision making to evolve more naturally, not in advance of the situation, but at the point of care where it's needed, and how to train individuals to have those conversations. Is that um, kind of part of the effort? versus trying to predict it in advance. Well, I think that might even be a, a part of a problem because we're not using what's going on in a person's life to you know, advocate or educate, just like I totally agree with Summer and Tracy. You know, we have starting points when we start to develop disease processes and the more we know about it, you know, that would be helpful. And this is probably why you know, the, the, you know, the thought that things aren't working right, you know, to go back to that video, I was kind of ended the video uh, with a gentleman talking about how um, it had no impact on uh, ER visits or ICU visits. I wouldn't expect an advanced care conversation to have any impact on the actual visits amount or you know, because there's no preventative care in it. It's just education and what do you want to do if. So, yeah, I, I would, you know, structure it a little more to comorbidities and issues that we were seeing in, you know, the primary care setting or, you know, if somebody doesn't have a primary care setting, then, you know, when they're going to the ERs and stuff and, yeah, just educating on what's going on and, and how that develops and slowing down the, or not slowing down, but having them educated to understand what we're all talking about. All right, then. I do wanna make sure that we have enough time to talk about the next slide. I believe the next slide is the last slide. Can we move forward one more? So this is where we kind of get into this idea of like up until now, you know, storing documents has really been the measure of our success. And um, it, throughout the state, there's other things that we're hearing, we're, we're seeing kind of like, how do we how do we understand the whole care environment, not just the flow of information? Um, so when we look at how we define success and what metrics, how do we identify what is success in the short term, in the longer term, how can we, as a, a mover of health information and healthcare data, help to influence and, and understand, are we making progress towards, um, towards having the right care environment that, that what, what are those measurements? So I think, I think in my own brain, We've got a serious lack of geriatricians, and we've got a serious lack of hosp or hospice and palliative care teams, understanding the presence of those within our environments that allow kind of more in-home care, to allow um, end-of-life care to evolve in a different way, not within hospital, if that is the, the individual's choice. Um, I think about kind of understanding kind of the progress if 75% of people want to kind of die and, and spend more time, quality time at home, understanding the metrics that say, you know, how many emergency department visits or, or, or hospital visits does an individual have in the last six months of life, how many times they receive um, uh, 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 chemotherapy within the, the, the two weeks prior to death. I mean, what what are those measurements of success? When we think about the usefulness of health information data, we think about it in terms of pro process change. We think about it in terms of evolving quality and trending it long-term to know whether or not we're making progress. Aside from just the presence of an advanced care planning uh, patient advocate, what are those measures that might be considered? This is kind of taking a slightly different direction. So come with me. <laughs> you 
you know, I would think the measurements would be to 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 evaluate the success of your uh, advanced um, thoughts would be the you know the the end notes to compare did 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 this treatment align with that perspective? That's the only thing I got to offer on that. Other thoughts? Sorry, Lisa. I remember um, you and Van had presented uh, a few months back um, to my hen, or I'm sorry, to the HIT Commission. And um, I think that you had tracked or talked about the number of um, advanced directive documents that were currently available and how often and by whom um, they were accessed. And, and so I wonder if that might be. Um, just like to serve as a baseline, maybe, um, as we start talking this through. But um, I wanted to just kind of go back to, I did I did drop in the chat some information. Um, there was a, uh, a Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan um, uh, innovation or in, um, initiative for physician organizations to participate with palliative care uh, training. And um, I think there were five POs that were chosen like as a um, as a cohort, like as a pilot program. And another measure that they were looking at and that they were starting to use were number of primary care providers who had um, completed the training um, for palliative care in a primary care office. Um, and then also they looked at for patient centered medical homes. Um, the number of, there's capabilities for PCMH um, for those primary care providers and how many of those providers had actually completed uh, um, training and also how many of them had incorporated um, advanced care planning as part of their, um, uh, part of their like regular practice. And so then like an objective measurement, of the, like they were self-attesting for that, that sort of thing. But um but also another ob ob objective measurement of that would be then looking at the codes used um, for advanced care planning just to see, okay, how often, how frequently are they having those conversations? That could just be like one way to, to, to look at that. Sure. Dr. Zarukian, as a, a, a care provider, how do you feel about kind of the, the what Teresa is talking about? Uh, long conversation, probably, but um, in general, I think, you know, it includes elements of what can get us to a better place. I mean, um, so uh, I, I certainly endorse trying to find some reasonable hook, if you will, for what it what constitutes evidence that somebody is routinely attending to things like um, goals of care discussions. Uh, and not just having an advanced directive in place and just sort of ignoring things and, until the crisis occurs. Great. Amy, I see your hand up. Um, and I'm not sure how I would track um, goals of care discussions, uh, but as far as our intent to try and get more patient advocate designation um, forms created, uh, you could track uh, referrals that the providers make for advanced care planning discussions. Um, our health system has uh, trained facilitators in all of our ambulatory offices. So we're able to track who's making referrals to have an advanced care planning discussion. And in order to do that, they must have met with the patient. So they start the discussion and send the referral. So we can at least track, you know, who who is caught on to the message that it's important to have these conversations, it's important to have the document and um, where our opportunity exists for further education. Is that something, I, and I'm curious, would that be something that is tracked kind of on a PO level? Is that something that should be a statewide measure? Like coming back to this idea of standardization mm -hmm. or is this like a PO process level? So, so Lisa, yes, I'm sorry. So, so that for, I know for Blue Cross's initiative, it was at the PO level, but this is where it's problematic 
when we're talking about HIE because we still don't have um, we we don't have a good way to connect with those uh, with those ambulatory providers, right? So if we're saying, I mean, we're still we're still I don't want to say struggling, but we're still working on like getting CCDAs from the ambulatory providers. So to say, oh, okay, well now we're going to start getting a state repository for um, advanced directives uh, from these ambulatory providers. We're going to have a big problem unless we have like some serious uh, either incentive, either a carrot or a stick, basically. Yes. Um, and and even then, it's like okay, we really need to show the benefit to um, incentivizing it or mandating it um, in in order to justify that. And I think I think we're a ways away from that. So it, it does come back. Unfortunately, it's like coming back to the to the hospitals to say. Hey, how are you handling this? And I mean, you guys are the biggest senders of all the info now. So yeah, it's a toughie. Very tough. So, and that's why I kind of come back to like some of the Atlas data um, as, and, and whether or not there is a way to utilize the information that is flowing through the health information exchange to help get us there, you know, before somebody aggregates it and it's three years old. Um, you know, like, is there, is there a role for an HIE in that level of measurement that gives us more information that is actionable within the state in a shorter time frame? Um, is this, is this a, a conversation that needs to continue? Is this like, are we there yet? Is that, are we at a point of recommendations for something like uh, like a different way to be able to evaluate and measure this. And, and if we are, that's great. Then we can put forth recommendations. If we're not, then it then the recommendation might be to form, formal, uh, formalize a, a, a work group to work on that. Dr. Zerukian? Yeah, I would just ask the group the question, do we feel like we've um, consolidated a view around the evidence base and what to recommend based on what the evidence base tells us, um, and then what this expert, you know, group opinions are with regard to a reasonable next step over the course of the, you know, next few years with regard to what it is that you know we're, we would like people to have, how they would share it, and um, how we would measure whether doing so makes a difference. That was a question to all of you. <laughs> it was. Yeah, just I, I definitely think that the the measuring of the uh, ED visits, hospitalizations in the last six months, or maybe I see maybe twelve months of life, having the evidence could be really helpful to know uh, to measure quality. Um, it just needs to be, I think, further explored. I think again, the first steps are definitely keeping it simple. And I think further evaluation of what other steps to take uh, should come thereafter. Okay. Other folks? So uh, I'll jump in with one thing. So the, the problem with that whole thing is it may be good or bad care for a patient to go to the ED. The question is what's beneficial care and what's non-beneficial care? And how can you know in the context of the situation the person's in, is the goal for people who have an advanced directive fewer visits to the ED? And if so, under what circumstances? Because to me, that's more like hospice care or cardiac arrest, which is what I put in the chat. Like everything else, until you know more, it's hard to say you shouldn't be going to the ED because you have an advanced directive and you wouldn't want to be on a ventilator. Well, that's not the question, I guess, at least as I look at it. I think, I, I, and I have a slightly different take on that. I kind of look at it from the idea of majority of people kind of when they think about kind of how they want um, to to 70% of people say they want to spend more time with their loved ones. 70% of people say they want to spend more time um, at home. Um, 
and you know, for people who are spending a great deal of time within the hospital, it gives us an indication, not like a solid like one to one, but an overall indication as to how we're doing. Which then might be the issue of should more people move to hospice sooner because what they're telling you is that's what they actually want is comfort, not cure, and the end the end stage of palliation, which is hospice. So again, an ED yeah. is a very, to me, a very rough tool for determining anything about whether something good or bad has happened. So would so what you're saying is that it's not so much the ED visits or 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 um, hospital inpatient visits, but it's the presence of of um, palliative care uh, admissions or hospice admissions that might be a good indicator. Or, or or we're not there yet. It yeah, I think it's a I think it's a maybe. I think I heard earlier. I don't know if it was Orist or someone else who said something I, I really resonate with, which is the answer is if if you take a person at the end of their experience and say, was this consistent with the wishes you established before you came, because you survived this, and are is was it therefore a good thing? For example, you came to the ED. Did somebody intubate you against your very clear? Um, designation because you couldn't speak for yourself and it's very clearly spelled out, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I hate to say it, but it, there's probably, we have two risks. One is to have something that's not actually a good indicator of what good care necessarily looks like. And the risk that um, the, the measures are gonna be, are we saving money as opposed to, are we meeting a patient's needs in the moment? And it's obviously not a fair comparison but it's not an easy measure for me, at least either. Sure. All right, I wanna, I wanna be cognizant of our time. This has been a great conversation. Please tell me that we've reached the end of the slides. <laughs> Are we? Yes, okay. So we have a couple of wrap up things. I so appreciate all of you being able to stay with us. It's been two really great um, hours of conversation and, and understanding. Um, I really want to encourage everybody to be able to join the conversation again on May 10th. I want to make sure that while I'm finishing talking, we are deploying our poll because we want to have that pre and post. Uh, so uh, uh, my uh, poll people, if you can go ahead and kind of deploy that poll, and if you could take just a few minutes to go ahead and answer those questions again, greatly appreciate it. Um, uh, and I think... I just want to say a big thank you. Um, we have these conversations to be able to truly understand how to help move help, help move my hand forward, to help move the information forward that is valuable to care teams and not do things that are not valuable to care teams. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Once you have kind of taken the time to, to take the poll, feel free. Um, thank you. Band team, any any last bits? Yeah, well, just wanted to thank everybody for their feedback. I think, um, especially identifying what, what what context and what background you're from, and and certainly sharing the personal stories were were ultimately helpful. Um, I, I I have a ton of notes from those individual perspectives, not just the comments, but where where it's all coming from. And so ultimately it, it really helps me in kind of understanding um, kind of what, what, what we're going to towards, you know, what it means success. So thank you again. All right, thank you. All right. We'll just kind of leave the poll up there and as you are, finished, you can feel free to depart. If our team can stick around, uh, that would be great.